I now have pleasure in welcoming Professor Gordon Parker AO. He's currently Sciencia Professor of Psychiatry, University of New South Wales, and was Executive Director of the Black Dog Institute from 2002 to 2011. He was for nearly two decades head of the School of Psychiatry at UNSW and director of the Division of Psychiatry at Prince of Wales and Prince Henry Hospitals. He has had a number of responsibilities for the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists, including being editor of the journal and chair of the Quality Assurance Committee. He has been an active researcher and has held a number of positions with legal organisations, including the New South Wales Guardianship Board and the New South Wales Administrative Appeals Tribunal. In 2004, he received a Citation Laureate as the Australian scientist most highly cited in the field of psychiatry and psychology. His research has focused on modelling psychiatric conditions, depressive, bipolar and personality disorders, and examining causes, mechanisms and treatments for mood disorders. And in a past life, he has had a book of fiction as well as an autobiography published. He's written for the Mavis Bramston Show. Some of us older ones would remember that. <laughs> Oz Magazine, ABC Science Broadcaster, book reviewer for the Sydney Morning Herald, and also had a play produced. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gordon Parker. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Beata, and also a thank you to the college for the invitation and for the excellent organization that went into the preparation of this session. I'd also like to um, provide a personal story, um, and this is of a Sydney general practitioner, and I can give his name. His name is Martin Homer. And firstly, I want to take you through his feelings about experiencing a de melancholic, depressed mood. So here we go. Martin chose to go to work. It was a week marked by nights of little sleep. He dreaded going to bed, fearful of the endless nights. He might fall asleep for an hour or two with sleep not cancelling the negative self-talk and irrational thoughts. Then almost invariably between 3 and 3.10 a.m. he would be completely awake. One night, he morbidly recalled the Scott Fitzgerald observation that quotes, in a real dark night of the soul, it is always three o'clock in the morning, end of quote. The watching hour, the hour when some malevolent predator would attack. Martin's mood was black, bleak, and sometimes Blake, ruminating over Blake's mantra that some are born to endless nights. And another, and other T.S. Eliot allusions came to mind. He felt he was one of the hollow men, the stuffed men, showing shape without form, shade without colour, occupying the dead land, and that this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Over the period of the night, he felt he existed only as a shadow between the essence and the descent. But an hour or two later, he'd force himself out of bed, go straight to the shower, turn the tap on at full force, at times too hot, seeking to feel something, preferring pain to his psychic analgesia. After a slice of toast and cup of coffee, he'd be out of the house, out before dawn, out before the lamentations of the crows, at the practice before six, determined to spend the hours before seeing patients, catching up with the paperwork. While he could readily turn on the computer, it was hard for him to turn on his brain, to boot it up. His mind became mushy, his thinking slowed by mental flotsam, and finding even the tap of the keyboard irritating. He'd try to process the paperwork for an hour, but then, frustrated by the mindlessness of most of the tasks and by his sense of impotence, he would sweep papers into his desk for handling the next day and lie inert and hopper-esque on the examination couch until the receptionist buzzed him for the first patient of the day. He could only crawl this marathon. After he self-medicated with a tricyclic antidepressant, 
he went high. And here's a quote from a letter that he wrote to his wife, who was in England, Sarah. And it goes like this. Dear Garlands are nine. Sarah in England, an anagram, of course. But we will indeed, in reality, have been separated for a period of nine days. So long indeed that you truly do deserve to be covered in nine garlands as you triumphantly re-enter Australia. Terra nullius, as we were so inferred by the British, who claimed the land as uninhabited and unsettled. The invaders professed and finessed noblesse as they repressed, compressed and suppressed the invaded who were distressed and oppressed by the ingressed to acquiesce and who called it progress and success. Nevertheless came the Marbo finesse, which might better now be called the Marbo original de uh, decision, but I digress. And today is Wednesday, a day almost long started. I ran to the sounds of silence and to west at the start. And someone, let me call him Bill, and I believe him to be a talkback radio man, as they all have four-letter Christian names, was preparing by airing his vocals before crowing his cock at dawn by running west to east. And as we ran, did we know that we, we too, we too were destined to pass each other by, for me to say, hi, wise guy, but for him to deny, to speechify a reply, but then and I qualify, perhaps he was shy and I should not vilify. And so we all start from one part or another and may pass like strangers or stranglers in the night, perhaps to never meet or perhaps to become acquaintances, comrades, friends or bosom friends. So that's a quote from the um, novel that I published um, last year um, with a very generous um, um, annotation by Stephen Fry trying to capture what it is like uh, for a doctor, for a general practitioner to experience the depths of melancholia and also a manic high. Martin is a very righteous man, loved by his patients, always does the right thing. But during his manic high, he hooks up with a lady with the borderline personality from hell and all breaks loose. Um, it, it also addresses issues of self-medication, the difficulties in being put before the medical board uh, and issues of redemption. Um, turning now to some firmer data, many of you would be aware of this Beyond Blue study. Uh, I think the methodology was very dubious. Uh, it was almost definitely overrepresented by those who did have mood disorders, but nevertheless, the data may be indicative to some degree. One in five doctors uh, had either been diagnosed and or treated for depression and 6% were currently depressed at the time of the survey. 25% of those surveyed had been suicidal in the preceding 12 months. I want to overview the two disorders, again as captured in the novel, um, to give you a feel for what I think are the quintessential biological depressive disorders. Firstly, melancholia, which has a distinctive set of clinical signs and symptoms. We recognise greater genetic and biological causal factors. Um, it's an equal opportunity mongrel, can attack anybody independent of their personality style. And it shows selective response to physical treatments. That is, it does well with antidepressant drugs, ECT, although rarely required, and shows very little or minimal response to psychotherapy. This is a cartoon we published in the American Journal of Psychiatry, a patient of mine who is a very successful lawyer and captures when she was struck down by the melancholia. She had such a lack of energy, she couldn't even lift her head off the pillow. Her mother had to come by and feed her and give her drink, and even to unscrew the lid on the tablet bottle because she lacked the strength. And she said to me, Gordon, I feel as though I've got my brain in a bottle. So this captures the profound psychomotor disturbance of melancholia, both physical and cognitive. The key symptoms to melancholia, and I know as medical students you would have been given a list of chant, including early morning wakening and others, that while common in melancholia are not specific to melancholia, so I want to give you symptoms that have high prevalence in melancholia and are almost non-existent in other types of depression. First is this profound psychomotor disturbance, and here you see a man hunched over, um, bent, um, almost as if Atlas um, 
is on his shoulders, but in fact it's the black cloud. One interesting feature I notice is the loss of light in the eyes of people with melancholia. It's a very neat question if you're interviewing adolescents where you suspect it and you ask the parents. And they'll say that when he's depressed or when she's depressed, there is this loss of light in the eyes, almost as if they're looking at a dead fish. People become very insular as part of those two components. They have a non-reactive mood. They can't be cheered up by anything, or at best it's ephemeral, such as seeing their grandchildren, and they might be able to smile for a minute at max. Anergia is one of the most distinctive features, an inability to get out of bed that feels like no energy at all. It's not a motivational. And if they get out of bed, um, they may just go and slouch in front of the TV immediately. They, even parsimonious people may not bathe or wash for a week. Um, and so it's this lack of energy that is central. Importantly, diurnal variation operates. That is, they tend to have their mood and energy worse in the morning. Anhedonia, lack of pleasure in life. Impaired concentration. The key thing that I look for is a fogginess of thinking in addition to inability to register information. Secondly, I want to look at bipolar disorder. This is a complicated model of bipolar one. It's essentially showing that during highs, oh, I've gone the wrong way, during highs, uh, people oscillate between psychotic manic states and during depressed phase, they either have psychotic depressive episodes or episodes of melancholia. Bipolar 2, by contrast, is a non-psychotic condition and people oscillate between hypomanic and melancholic depressive episodes. When I'm seeking to find out about bipolar, I ask whether, in addition to feeling depressed, they have times when they feel more energised and wired, that it's beyond normal states of happiness. DSM requires it must last five days, but that's a nonsense. We get plenty of people where it might only last episodes of a few hours or a day. And then there are characteristic features. They're energised, they're wired, they're playful, they polyphase, moving from task to task. They feel bulletproof and invulnerable. They talk more, they're loud, they're verbally and socially indiscreet. It's a stigma territory because when people come down from highs, it's a lot of shame about what they did. People have walked the path of moral rectitude. A 50-year-old woman, chaste, virginal, never married, auditioned for a brothel for the first time when she was high. And to her shame, she was offered the position. They need less sleep and they don't feel tired. Libido increases dramatically. They spend money. They feel creative. Everything links with everything else. They can generally are elated or happy, but also there's a percentage who are snappy. Anxiety disappears or attenuates. That's not in the literature, but it's one of the key features of a high. It's a carefree zone. Um, and the psychomotor activation is one of my pl uh, patients said, Gordon, when I'm high, I get speeding fines. When I'm depressed, I get parking fines. <laughs> they crave alcohol and they can consume vast amounts. One young woman in her 20s normally drinks three glasses of wine and she is a bit... Uh, um, disinhibited, when she's high she can drink a bottle of vodka and a bottle of wine and she's coherent. Take Winston Churchill, famous person with bipolar 2, average 15 to 20 standard drinks for decades. It's a performance enhancer, it can be reactive at times to events and they intriguingly often experience suprasensory phenomena. So during a high someone would be able to say, I can hear um, the light rail over there. They hear things that we can't hear. Uh, they smell things, uh, hyper uh, acute in their sensory phenomenon. It's a most interesting condition. Unfortunately, most people in this country, as in other Western countries, don't get the diagnosis because they're not screened for bipolar. And if you get the diagnosis, it's 50 to 20 years. Um, quick summary. I think in terms of addressing these key mood disorders, we need to destigmatize, we need to address and redress stresses, we need to remove barriers to getting help. Uh, those are all factors that I'm sure will be emphasized in the discussion. The other thing is we need far more sophisticated management. We've been told by the pharmaceutical companies that all antidepressants are equally effective. That is not true. For melancholy, the SSRIs are rarely beneficial, maybe in those under the age of 40, but after that, rarely. 
greater efficacy comes from the dual action and even greater from the tricyclics and the MOIs and a whole series of augmentation strategies. There's no clear reason unless somebody is showing early signs of a vascular dementia that you cannot get them out of a melancholic episode. This is high yield territory. For bipolar disorders, my favorite is lithium for BP1 and lamotrigine for BP2. Lamotrigine is pretty ineffective for BP1, but fabulous, uh, about a 70% effectiveness rate as long as you pick the non-generic, because there are 12 non-generics that are often are completely um, inappropriate in terms of their um, quantity of lamotrigine. Um, and I guess my final um, point in 30 seconds would be, what are the challenges? Well, the challenges, I think, are getting doctors to, to seek help. Um, mostly the doctors that come along to me are obviously a self-selected group. They're comfortable about doing it. They don't carry on in any VIP way. Um, they behave just like any other patients. Secondly, I think there's a general recommendation that when somebody's depressed, they go see their GP. That's only relevant if the GP is good at mood disorders. And as a generalisation, which is going to get me in a lot of trouble, then basically female general practitioners are far more receptive to handling people with depression. We did a study at the Black Dog Institute. The average referral letter from a male GP was 15 words. From a female, it was 110 words. The average duration for the consultation by those referred was 35 minutes from a female GP and seven minutes from a male GP. Um, so if your GP, um, as soon as you mention the word depression, eyes drop and starts reaching for the prescription pad, that's not going to be ideal. So we need to know that people can get to good help and that good help is hard to get. Third issue is I think we need specific strategies for doctors. Um, for young interns and residents, um, I have no problems with their permission in writing letters to their a medical administration asking that they don't go on night duties. Anyone with melancholy or bipolar disorder that's active, that's going from day to night, is potentially in real trouble. And the final issue that is probably the biggest one of the lot, and I don't know how prevalent it is, and that is the issue of self-medication. About 10% of the doctors that I see will talk about self-medication. I suspect the real figure is about 90%. But it's something that they feel either guilty or so ashamed about or worried about the consequences, they don't take you into the nuances. And that, I think, is probably one of the big sleeper items. But to finish with the key message, uh, for melancholia and for bipolar 2 disorder, this is high yield territory. We can bring these conditions under control as long as the treatment is rational and not a one size fits all model. Thank you all. Thank you.